And when I put together my talk, I realized that this area is still too large for a one-hour talk. So I focus specifically on one learning model, which will be uh, learning from an oracle. So learning the monotone function when it is described implicitly by some other system. And I will show some examples what that means. So first, I will just introduce a few notions, few notations about monotone Boolean functions, just to recall uh, essentially what Eve said specifically about monotonicity. Uh, I apologize if, if, can you see the color? You see, I carefully repainted my lecture so that uh, the organizers asked me to have a dark background, but that makes the colors come out differently. I apologize. So we talk about truth values, variables in this from uh, 1 to n, and binary vectors on x is the subset of indices. So, so I, I view binary vectors as indicator variables of subsets. So I will come back and forth a little bit freely, and I apologize if it uh, between between vectors, binary vectors, and subsets of a base set, finite base set. Uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence here, and the Boolean function, just like you said, is a mapping from the binary vectors to the Boolean values. I represent truth as one, false as zero, and uh, we distinguish the, the, every function separates. Uh, the, the set of Boolean vectors into two groups. One we call the true points, the, all the vectors where f takes value true, and the false points, all the points where f takes value false. So this is quite general so far. When we say that a function is monotone, if every time a vector is component-wise below another vector, then the corresponding truth value is also below where 0 is less than 1. So that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I use rather uh, integer values instead of the Boolean values because I can compare them as inequalities. So monotonicity just means that if you add more features, if you extend the set where the function was already true, then, then it, it will, new value will be also true. Uh, now, how to describe a monotone function? And uh, of course, as Eve said, every, every Boolean function has DNF and CNF representations. And typically, those are not unique. But a kind of minimal representation for monotone functions is unique. So we will distinguish among all the true points the minimal true points, that is, which component-wise minimal and still true. Right? So that means, that means if I, if, if I look at all the points which are strictly below x, at least in one component, then all those points are false points. I cannot go below still staying true. And uh, we distinguish what we call maximal false points where the opposite property is true. If you would switch any of the 0 bits to 1, you would get a true point. So these are the maximal false points. And uh, every monotone function has this unique monotone DNF. Where, where the DNF terms are related to the minimal true points. Every minimal true point defines a term. And it's monotone because we don't have any complementation there. And also, there is a, C, a unique CNF where, where the off, the zero positions of the maximal false points define the closes. Again, we don't need complementation because this is a monotone function. So, so this is the representation, right? So if you want to learn a monotone Boolean function, you have to learn either the minimal true points or the maximal false points, or both, if you like, to be able to say which monotone Boolean function we talk about. The only problem is that typically this DNF is large. So in terms of whatever description we have and or knowledge, the, the, the monotone function under this model typically has exponentially many terms and exponentially many clauses in this minimum representation. So when we talk about identification, the complexity of the problem is uh, a little bit of a question. Since just to write down this representation, you would need exponential time in terms of few representations. So we, we have to clarify precisely what do we mean under identification and how we measure efficiency. Just a few properties. It typically happens that the cardinalities of minimal true points and maximal false points are very different. This ratio could be exponential in the, number, in the dimension, and it could be exponential in the size of the other set. 
there are all kinds of extremes are achievable here. So we'll, we'll come back to this. This is an important uh, point. Now, another way of viewing monotone functions is that I look at the subsets of indices which correspond to minimal true points. Right, that defines a hypergraph. Then in this language, if we look at, uh, sorry, if we look at the subsets corresponding to the zeros of the false points, I don't know how much you can see here, then what we get is exactly the dual hypergraph. That is the family of all minimal transversals. A transversal is a subset which intersects every hyperedge, and minimality is with the usual notion, containment wise minimal. So all minimal transversals are exactly the zeros corresponding to the maximal force points. And this goes back and forth. So this, this two hypergraphs form a, a pair of dual pairs. And so, so it is another typical identification problem that you know a monotone system in the sense that you know all minimal true points. But for your application, you would need to know all the maximal force points. So given age, how to determine age dual? That's what is called hypergraph dualization. Right? <coughs> now, for, for this talk, we will assume that the monotone function is represented by a membership oracle. That is, for any given point, the oracle can tell us whether that point is a true point or false point. And the target problem is to determine, in some sense, the monotone Boolean function. So one variant of this problem is that, let's say we already learned all the minimal true points, or somebody gave us, and we learned a subset of the maximal false points. Can we decide if this is all, or there are other maximal false points? Right? So can, and if, if, if not, if this is not all, we also expect to generate a new maximal false point, which is not in the given list. So this is a basic step, and we will come back to this. This is what we call dualization or monotone dualization or hypergraph transversal problem. There are many names, but they cover all the same problem. And the primary decision problem is this step, <coughs> that you, you start generating the dual, and at every given moment, you have to be able to say whether I stop, I have everything, or I need to go forward and have to find a new one. So we will keep repeating this problem. And what we know about it, that this decision problem is uh, solvable in quasi-polynomial time. Uh, this is by Fredman and Hachian in 96. So, so what it means is probably this is not an MPR problem. In other words, there is this explicit conjecture that MPR problems cannot be solved sub-exponential time. This is sub-exponential time. So that's almost surely this decision problem is not in the family of MPR problems. And uh, and it might not be in the family of polynomially solvable problems either, because many people tried to find a more efficient solution, and this is, this is the best algorithm what we know so far. Again, this problem comes under many different names, and there is a large literature who uh, are trying to solve it. There are many algorithms, actually, which solve this problem, and they have slightly different complexities. I just cite two. You can actually answer this question using parallel computation, in polylogarithmic time, in polylogarithmic computing depths, you can find the answer, but you need to use quasi-polynomially many processors. And this is what I call quasi-polynomial. So this is something uh, uh, polylogarithmic uh, uh, exponent. Now, uh, there is another parallel algorithm. Sorry. Yeah, you will never see the bottom because that's always red. Sorry for this. There is another parallel algorithm which is somewhat simpler than this, and that solves directly in logarithmic depths, simple logarithmic depths, but also uses quasi-polynomially many processors. Of course, any of these parallel algorithms you can run in a series way and get back, get back a similar performance that you have here. For. So there are several algorithms which treat this problem. None of them is polynomial, unfortunately. Now, let me see. what. What kind of monotone oracles we can think of? Let me give a few examples. There are many, many, actually. Graph connectivity, right? So we can think of the variables as edges. And uh, a subset is a true point, corresponds to a true point of a Boolean, monotone Boolean function. 
if within that subset there is a connection from u to v. Right? Then the minimal true points will be the simple passes from vertex u to v. This is a connectivity function, and clearly it's monotone. If you add more edges, you cannot destroy connection, right? So once you have a connection, you add more edges, it remains connected. So this is one example. The graph surface an oracle, and uh, the minimal true points are exactly the simple passes from the u to v, and the maximal false points are, are uh, the, the cuts. The cuts which are minimal cuts which separate, the complements of minimal cuts which separate u from v. That's, uh, so this is an example where we have a reasonable simple oracle, right? If you give me an edge set in linear time, I can test if it has a connection from u to v or not. Uh, but the number of minimal true points and the number of maximal false points could be exponentially large depending on the graph structure. So here are some examples. So these are the maximal edge sets. The maximal false points are maximal edge sets which do not connect u to v. That is, the complement is a minimal cut between u and v. Now, there are many, many related results. We can talk about minimal uv passes, minimal uv cuts, or spanning, spanning trees if you don't talk about connectivity between two vertices, but connectivity of the entire graph, then spanning trees uh, and minimal cuts in the graph are corresponding minimal through maximal false points. We can talk similarly about generating maximal stable sets or minimal vertex cuts, the complement of which are maximal clicks. So these are all similar problems to define a monotone system uh, by, by a graph. The oracle is a graph itself. And you give me a, a subset of the vertices in this case, I can, I can see if it's stable or I can see if it's a click, right? So it's easy to test in polynomial time the value of the function and the minimal maximal elements are all these objects, maximal stable sets, minimum, maximal clicks. Uh, here is a, a very short extraction list of papers. There are many, many people who worked on this type of problems, how to generate all of these type of objects. Given a graph, how to generate all the simple passes between two vertices, how to generate all the spanning trees. Now, generation is slightly different. There is a classical area in mathematics called counting, right? Probably you are aware that many, many mathematical subjects is treated in terms of some generating polynomials where the coefficients are typically numbers of objects of a certain type. And counting is a classical area in mathematics where we try to determine the number of those objects. So determining the number of minimal simple passes or determining the number of spanning trees, this is a counting problem. The output is a single number. And counting problems, therefore, tend to be harder because you have to count all objects and output a single number, right? In generation, we, the output is long. You have, to, you have to point all objects. You have to list all objects. So the output length is very large. So that means if you want to be reasonable in, in uh, the computing requirement, you have much more computing effort to put into the, to the generation problem. So there is a... A relation between the two and in some sense it's for some problems there are some equivalences I will point this out. Another example is data mining right so for the sake of simplicity we have a zero one matrix here uh, the ones define a relation between the columns and the rows right so we say that for the orange set of columns AC we can associate all the rows where the entries are full ones. This, this sub-matrix is full ones. And there's a unique maximal set of rows which I can associate. And to every set of row, there's a unique maximal set of columns. And these are called uh, maximal frequent sets are the maximal column sets for which the number of rows, corresponding number of rows is at least k. Then we call it maximal k frequent set. So if you have a threshold k, then you can generate all these maximal sets. This is one of the principal task in data mining to generate all these maximal frequency sets because this represents somehow an interesting structure. If this is a, a matrix about uh, uh, transactions, right, every row is a customer, every column are items in your store, the ones mean that the customer bought, then, then every, every row represents a, a purchase and it may be interesting which items are purchased together or with high frequency or, or, or reasonable frequency. So this maximal set each provide an interesting set of items which somehow belong together. So one interesting thing is how to generate all these maximal frequent sets. Of course, what is the, the negation? 
what are the counterpart, all minimal sets such that the corresponding supporting set of rows is less than k, right? So these are called minimal infrequent sets. So this is again a monotone function behind this system where frequent sets are, are uh, the false points, uh, infrequent sets are the true points, minimal infrequent sets are the minimal true points, maximal frequent sets are the maximal, maximal false points. And uh, the matrix serves as an oracle. So if you give me a subset, we can test if it's true or false, if it's frequent or not, just by looking at the matrix in linear time again. Uh, <coughs> many people worked on this area. Sloan, Takata, and Turan actually asked the question uh, first, what is the complexity of generating these sets? And uh, uh, later we could answer this. I, I may mention it. Another interesting uh, application area is coming from databases or, or classification, as Eve mentioned. Imagine, let's say a classification example. Imagine that you have points in, the, in some Euclidean space representing observations. These are the input vectors. And there are two groups, one true points, one false points. Right? Now, uh, now a pattern in the sense Eve mentioned could be generalized into a cube, a subcube, or, or a substripe of, of the Euclidean space in which you have only one kind of point, either only true or only false. Then it's a true pattern or false pattern. Now, if you delete, if you just keep one class of points, then actually the obstruction of a pattern, which would be pattern for the other class, is a maximal subrectangle or subcube, which is empty. This also has a meaning in databases, where, where this is a rel relational database, such maximal empty rectangles represent unrelated, maximal unrelated pairs where, where the relation is missing. So this is again a good question. Which are these maximal empty rectangles? What are the minimal counterpart? What is the negation of this? The minimal regions which are not empty. These are the points themselves. So, so of course, we view this as discretized. So there is, this is not really a continuous range. You can discretize it because you have finitely many points, somehow discretize it. And then in this discrete scale, then, then the minimal sets are one by one subrectangles corresponding to the points. And the maximal empty rectangles is some sizes. And again, the question, how many are there or how to generate them efficiently? So this is another example for identification, monotone identification. Uh, it was introduced first in a geometric setting in 86. And then in the data uh, base setting in, uh, in 2001, actually Edmonds worked on it to settle the, the complexity of the generation problem. Another good example is probably coming up in, even in multi-criteria optimization is generating the Pareto efficient frontier for some monotone property. In, uh, in, in, in a simple setting, we can say that you have a set of points on, on, in an Euclidean space. And uh, to every point, you associate the, all the points above it. The, the positive orton shifted the vertex to that point. Then you can measure how many points sit inside that orton from the given. Or if you have weights or probabilities associated to the points, then you can measure what is the probability of being above. That is, you compute the the probability distribution function. And uh, we say that a point is efficient at some level if the total weight underneath is at, most z, uh, at least z. Or, or you can turn around and talk about above it. Both, both definition defines a monotone system. Of course, the negation is the inefficient point is when, when the total weight above is at most z, uh, less than z, strictly less than z. This, so again, here we have a monotone system. Clearly, if I shift, monotone here means not on the binary scale. We can transform it back to the binary scale. But here, monotonicity is in the original space meaningful. That means that you increase coordinates one by one. That is, you compare com component-wise the vectors. Then if I shift something upward, clearly I cannot increase the number of points in the upper orthant and cannot decrease in the lower orthant. So this, the total weight, if these are non-negative weights, are, are, is, behaves as a monotone function of, of this position. This was introduced in stochastic programming in 2000. 
And again, this is a case where the input can be very simple, maybe a few hundred points in uh, 20 dimensions. And the output may be very large, maybe millions of, of uh, efficient points. So the question again arises how to generate all these efficient points. The other example is, comes from optimization. So imagine that we have a non-negative matrix, and we look at the inequalities AX like this B, where X is a binary vector. Of course, if you have a binary vector, which is a feasible solution here, and you flip a 0 to 1, since the A is non-negative, you get again a feasible point. So the set of feasible points forms a monotone subset. So if viewed as a true points of a function, this will be a monotone Boolean function. So how to generate all minimal feasible solutions? This was asked by Laurel and Reno back in 1980. Or how to generate a maximal infeasible solutions? It turns out that in some scheduling problems, this play an important role. You want to know all of them because they are kind of blockers of a certain schedule type. Uh, so here comes the question, how to measure efficiency of these generation algorithms? So generally, we view hypergraph generation that there's an oracle representing this hypergraph. That is, I can ask if a set is member or not, a membership oracle. And uh, somehow, I want to organize a computation which generates all hyperedges one by one without repetition. Right? So I want an algorithm which behaves like this. It crunches numbers for a time, and then outputs a hyperedge, and then crunches Again, inside works, 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 and then outputs the second hyperedge. And at the end, after some time, we realize that we have all. I have a proof that we have all, and then we stop. So there are several ways of measuring efficiency of such algorithms. The, the simplest way to say all these time periods between two output events and between the final last output event and the final conclusion, the proof of of uh, uh, completeness is all limited by a polynomial of the input size, of the size of your oracle, whatever represents the system. If, if this happens, we say you generate with polynomial delay, because quite regularly in the same amount of time, you always output a new wedge set. Uh, a bit, little bit weaker notion is what we call incrementally polynomial. In this case, all these times are limited by a polynomial not only of the of the input size, but the number of elements generated so far. So the, the further uh, ahead you are, the more time you allow for the next output to be computed. Finally, the polynomial total time, we, we, we've mentioned already, we don't care about the individual times, but the total time what we spend should be polynomial in both the input and output sizes. That's, uh, that's the weakest notion. There are a couple of properties to mention here. So first of all, I mentioned for the dualization, but in general, there is a decision variant which we can ask here. You are in the middle of the generation. You have to be able to answer the question, are there any more to generate, or I, I can stop. I have everything. Right? So this next is a basic decision problem related to such generation processes. And there is a, a general zero I'm saying that that if you can solve this problem in polynomial time, then you can generate with incremental polynomial way. That is the middle notion we used. Uh, polynomial time, this means that you already have a subset generated. So polynomial in this input size, right? Here you have the, not only the oracle size, but also have the size of the set which we already generated. So it gives an incremental polynomial complexity for the total generation process. Now, if, if uh, if this problem turns out to be NP-hard, then we say that the, the generation, the incremental generation itself is an NP-hard task. Now, in principle, it is possible to, to have uh, the hypergraph generated in some way efficiently, but next, maybe an NP-hard problem. But this is a difficult thing to imagine, and actually, I don't have any example for such strange couples. It also could happen that, that uh, there are some problems where we know incremental polynomial generation. That is, the output is slower and slower, but only polynomially. But we don't know 
the more efficient polynomial delay, delay uh, generation. And we don't know either uh, that how, how to disprove the negative statement that you cannot generate in polynomial delay. We don't have an equivalent hardness proof. So, so MP hardness of the generation, MP hardness of the next decision problem is, is a clear notion. And we know that that shows you cannot have uh, an efficient incremental generation unless P equal MP. Right? But for, poly for uh, polynomial delay, we don't have a, a negative counterpart. We cannot really say this problem is hard for polynomial delay generation. There is no such thing. Let me, let me add, uh, before I go on, that actually there is a connection between incremental polynomial and total time polynomial. And the connection is that many of the problem families are Obviously, every incremental gives you total polynomial, but, but the reverse direction is also true for many problem families. Every time the problem family is closed <coughs> under additional restrictions about the base set, let's say in the hypergraph setting, I may say that I'm looking for some subsets, but I already know that this and these points must be in it, and those and those points cannot be in it. Now, this is a modified problem where I have a condition. If this problem belongs to the same problem family, that is the oracle works the same way, can compute membership under these conditions, then, incremental polynomial, then, then you can get an incremental polynomial by, from a, a total polynomial time procedure. So then the two notions are equivalent in some sense. And most of the problems have this restriction property. So here I, I am thinking of what is a membership oracle for a Bolton Boolean function, right? Ordinarily, it's a membership in the sense that for a particular vector, it can tell if it's a true vector or a false vector. But this oracle you can use to get a membership oracle for the family of minimal true points in some sense. Namely, if you have a true point, then just start flipping the ones to zero and ask again the oracle if it's true. If it's not, then you don't flip it. If it's true, you flip it. What you arrive will be a minimal true points at the end. And, and you had to make as many calls to the oracle as the number of one bits. And similarly, from a false point, you can try to flip the zeros to ones until you cannot, and then you get a maximal false point. And again, what you do is, is just a small number of calls to the oracle. So, so the original membership oracle for the Boolean function can also serve as an oracle for this uh, boundary points, the minimal true points and maximal false points. And so this is, you know, I'm not going to repeat this, but this is the way we use it uh, in the generation results. Now, there are many, many results, what can be generated and what cannot be. And I just give a sample, uh, mention a few. I thought I would rather list the possible techniques how to generate, because actually there are many. And there are several recent publications which show that somehow not everybody realizes the, what the, the different possible techniques. So the first very simple technique, we call it flashlight principle. But this is just a, a depth first search idea. Imagine that, that uh, you know, we, we view the problem as, a, as a generating maximally independent sets. Right? An independent system is the set of false points of a monotone Boolean function. <coughs> closed downward. The set is there, the subset is there. So we want to generate maximal false points of a monotone Boolean function. And we have this oracle for this. <coughs> then peeking ahead is the following procedure. We already assume some points must be in this maximal uh, independent set, and some points cannot be. The question, can we decide if there is really such a maximal independent set which satisfies this restriction? Right? So the, the, the theorem is that if, if you can answer this in polynomial time for all possible i and all sets, right? we don't ask numbers. We don't want to generate it. We just ask, is there a maximal independent set under these conditions? If you can answer this in polynomial time, then actually a depth first search will give you an efficient generation of all maximal independent sets. Of course, not every system has this property, but some does. For instance, uh, if you want to generate maximum independent sets in a metroid, that's a very old result. People do this way. Uh, a little bit maybe less known, Reed and Tarjan wrote a long paper about all kinds of generation problems. And the basic technique is this speaker head uh, lemma. I show you a small example. 
uh, imagine that given a graph, you want to generate all the maximal complete bipartite subgraphs. If, if, if this graph is, a, if, if this is a matrix, these are the frequencies, right? If, if this is a bipartite graph, then this previous frequency set, the maximal frequency sets were exactly those pairs of nodes which are complete bipartite graphs. But in general, this, this has an uh, interesting application in, in uh, representing some of those graphs. Now, so we, we call an edge set independent if, we, uh, if it's a subset of such a maximal complete bipartite graph. Right? So, so it, and the, the question how to generate all the maximal elements here. Again, I'm generating the all maximal false points of a monotone Boolean function. And here, you can easily check, actually, there is a very simple proof that this Pico head procedure is polynomial. Right? So, in fact, it's enough to prove it for, for cases when I, the set of edges which must be in it, describe a connected graph. And then you have to check if there is a complete bipartite graph containing all those edges without using edges in O, without using some orange edges which are forbidden. And that's a, it's a fairly easy, very easy routine. So automatically we get an efficient polynomial delay generation for all maximal complete bipartite graphs. This, this problem was studied by many people, uh, among them Eve. But they used a slightly different proof, a slightly different technique to, to do the generation. Uh, so here is a case when actually counting is probably not easy. So Kuznetsov showed that counting these complete, maximal complete bipartite graphs is sharply hard, which means that probably it's difficult unless p is equal to mp, uh, the counting problem. But nevertheless, the generation is easy. You can do it with polynomial delay. Again, because the output here is long, so you have much more computing power to, to waste and still remain efficient. Now, supergraph approach is a different method. It's, uh, again, we look at generating all maximum independent sets of an independent system given by, a, by an oracle. And we define a supergraph. The edges of the supergraph will be the vertices of this hypergraph, what we want to generate, right? all these maximal independent sets. Each of them we view as a, as a vertex. And we define a neighborhood relation. For every maximal independent set, we can generate some others. And this we call them their neighbors. You have to describe in every application there is a specific way how you do it. Maybe in the example later I will show one application I will tell how to do it. But imagine that you have such a definition, such local manipulations. You drop a point, add some other points, and get again a maximal independent set. And you do it in a, in a couple of different ways. And let's say that your definition leads to a situation where you can prove that the resulting directed graph over the vertex set H is uh, strongly connected. Then you can just do this repeatedly, right? Generate all the outgoing neighbors, put it into stock, and, and go ahead. Eventually, you will encounter all the nodes. And this gives immediately an incremental polynomial generation. So again, here we, we, you know, we just do a very simple thing. We just check the complexity of local changes. And then you do it as long as you can do it and get something new. And you can show that you get an incremental polynomial efficiency. In fact, to get this efficiency, you have to be a little bit tricky. So this is the standard trick in generation that you delay the output. Right? So we have to output without repetition. So every time I get a new set, I have to check if I already got it before, then I don't output it. But many times you get many, many new points at, new, new sets at once. And the idea to guarantee incremental generation, if, if at all is possible, is that you kind of keep it in head, you keep it inside the algorithm. And you just output them, you just output one. And again, do the generation and output one. So this way you can balance out. Sometimes you will have to work a lot. Maybe you got exponentially many new ones, then you have an exponential amount of time to get the next new one because you delay the output carefully. So in many situations, this is one of the situations where you have to do this careful output organization to get really a formal proof that you can do efficiently everything, depending on how powerful your neighborhood relation actually. So this technique was introduced by Shrikovsky and Speckenmeyer back in 97. 
to generate all the feedback arc sets and vertex sets of a directed graph. Uh, a feedback arc set is a minimal, minimal set of directed arcs, which if you remove, the resulting graph becomes acyclic. So the minimal set of arcs blocking all directed cycles in the graph. This is the feedback arc set. Uh, we can extend the same idea to generate all minimal two vertex connected subgraphs. And actually, you can generate this for matroids too. We can extend to matroids. All, all two connected uh, subsets of a matroid you can generate efficiently, the same technique. Uh, another technique is what we call the projection approach. The idea here is that you imagine that the base set, so again, we generate maximal independent sets, maximal false points of a Boolean function. We label the base sets, right, from 1 to n. These are the Boolean variables. And we look at, look at all the, the independent sets, which are maximal independent sets within the first interval up to j, for every j. Right? So, this, so, so if, you, if you look at only the first j points and you project your independent system that defines an independent system in the first j points, some of the sets there will be maximal independent sets. So let's say that, that uh, what we require here is that if for all such projections and all maximal independent sets in the first j minus 1, you can compute the maximal independent ones which are within i union j. So i is independent within the first j minus 1 elements. So it's independent in the entire set, right? Now I add one more point, j. I may destroy, if it's independent, I am happy. That's the only maximal independence that itself is independent. If I destroy independence that is became dependent, there might be many subsets which go through J and subset of I such that, uh, that that's in, in, uh, maximal independent within this projection. So assume that we can generate them efficiently. Then the claim is that you can get, then you can get an incremental polynomial generation for the input hypergraph. So this was introduced by Lawler, Lenz, and Reynoy-Kahn back in 1980. I already cited their paper. Uh, they used it for many different problems, generating clicks, stable sets, set packings, feasible solutions to an, a knapsack inequality with non-negative coefficients. So uh, there are many, many applications where this method works well. So here is an example. Uh, imagine that you have given a graph and the threshold t as a small integer, let's say 5, and we call a set of vertices independent, t independent, if the subgraph induced by this subset has no more than t edges inside. So when t is 0, this is just a standard uh, independence problem. But here you allow up to t edges inside the subset. The question, who are the maximal t independent sets? How to generate them? And here we can prove that this projection is doable because for every such subset in 2 and to the t time, essentially just by brute force testing, you can check what are the maximal independent sets when you extend the small set with one, more, with one more point. And that, of course, implies then the efficient generation. Uh, the last method, there are actually other methods, but the last one I want to talk today about is a closure operation. So everybody who works with Boolean functions probably knows this operation. It's a surprise maybe that it can apply to, to monotone systems. So imagine that, again, we want to generate maximal in the, the maximum false points of a Boolean function, monotone Boolean function, and we have an operation which to any pair of maximal force points associates, not to any, but to some pairs associates, this, this mapping may be, may be empty set mapping, but for some pairs it associates an other element. Right? For instance, uh, resolution or, or, uh, or uh, is, is such an operation. To two close, you associate a new close. Not always, sometimes it's the empty close, but still you can compute it and associate it. Now, we say that a subset is closed if this operation is always staying inside. Every time you take two elements from the set, 
the, the, the resulting set is again in the set, in the C. So, of course, closed families form a closure system. And uh, uh, to every set, we can associate the smallest closed set as, as its closure. And the claim is that if with your oracle, you can compute a subfamily such that its closure is the hypergraph itself, then you can do efficient generation. Then you can do incremental polynomial generation. Right? So this is, this is many uh, examples are from uh, generating all prime implicants or prime implicates of a given Boolean function. And you can view them as, as monotone if you view them as subsets of the literals, not of the variables, but if you allow both variables and complements. Then prime implicates are kind of minimal sets which correspond to true points of a, a Boolean function. And, and you can apply the same methodology. Another example is, is, uh, is the following. We, we define a subset of edges independent if the complementary set contains a cycle. So here, here I'm just talking about a simple graph, not that directed. And the cycle is just a simple cycle, right? So if the complement contains a simple cycle, I call it independent. That clearly defines an independent system. So again, the maximal independent sets will be maximal false points of a monotone Boolean function. And, uh, and we also know that if, if you have two cycles and they intersect, they have an edge in common, then there is another cycle in the union which doesn't go through that edge. There might be actually several. But let's say we pick always one. Sometimes it's unique, sometimes it's not. And we define the closure, oper the, the, the closure operator as, as associating C double prime this, this cycle to C and C prime. This is very simple to compute. You, I give you the edge set. You can check if there is a common point and generate the cycle inside it. So you can do it in linear time. Now, if you consider a spanning tree, then we can associate the cycle base to a spanning tree, right? That's it. Every edge outside defines a unique cycle through the three edges. And uh, so this, the collection of all these cycles form a subset C. And it's very easy to show that with this, if you repeat this operation, you can get to any other cycle by, by finitely many repetitions. So the closure of this set is, is all the, the maximal subsets which the complement has a cycle. So that, that's a way of generating all minimal cycle, all simple cycles of a graph efficiently. This gives an incrementally efficient generation. Now, let me show at the end, maybe very quickly, another interpretation of monotone identification, which is a little bit geometric, and it's a, a different view. So, so far, I was talking about hypergraph, hypergraph dualization, right? Uh, there is a very nice interpretation in terms of point set of vectors. So let's say that we call a subset a true point of a Boolean function. So given a set of vectors, a finite set of vectors, we call it, and, and the particular point, let's say the origin, zero, we call a subset uh, uh, a true point if the convex hull contains zero. Right? So here is an example that blue point set, which you might not see very well, the convex hull goes through the origin zero here, so that this is a true point. And less S of A, the set of all such minimal sets of points, the convex hull of which contains the origin. Right? This, there are some examples here. And the counterpart is, which are the maximal point sets, the convex hull of which doesn't contain the origin, right? So this, I denoted by SA star, these are the set of maximal false points of, a, of the related Boolean function. So this clearly defines a, a monotone function, right? If a convex hull contains oligo, if I add points, the convex hull gets only larger. It, it still will include. Now, there is a, another possible definition. Namely, I call a set true for another Boolean function if the interior of the convex hull contains the origin. So it cannot be on the boundary. It must be on the interior. It's, it's a very tiny change in definition, but look at this example. Three points, any of the three points of these four 
has an origin in the convex hull, <coughs> but in this sense you need the force point because it's not in the it's on the boundary of all the other combinations, right? So you have the minimal sets change, the minimal blue sets are slightly different because you may have points. It, the point set may be degenerated thereby with many many pairs of points or, or, or groups of points where the convex hull is on the boundary of the convex hull. And of course the the counterpart is all the maximal sets such that the the zero is not in the interior. So zero may be on the boundary or outside. I'm looking for all maximal such point sets. So this defines another uh, monotone function. And again, B, A, I, we call them bodies. So the F, maybe you said S of A, we call simplices, all the minimal subsets the convex hull contain the origo. And here we call bodies all the minimal subsets where the interior contains the origo. And uh, so let me give you a nice application of this. Imagine that the, you are given a graph, which is a, a strongly connected directed graph. And uh, I create the points for every directed edge. I take the j's unit vector minus the i's unit vector. So these are unit vectors with one plus one, one minus one coordinate, otherwise zero. And, uh, and a, g is the set of vectors associated to all of these edges, all of the directed edges. Then actually, this sets will have very nice meaning. The set of simplices are the simple directed cycles of the graph. The dual are the minimal feedback R sets, which I mentioned earlier. The complements of the dual are maximal acyclic subgraphs of G. And uh, the bodies are the minimal strongly connected subgraphs. And the dual are the minimal die cuts, that is, which destroy strong connectivity. And, uh, and the maximal force points are maximal subgraphs that are not strongly connected. They're just a negation of the previous one. So each of them has a meaning and has some interesting property. And so for each of them, there is a question how to generate. And in fact, in this case, they can be generated efficiently. We know that, that uh, both SA and this dual can be generated with polynomial delay. That was resolved by Sikorsky and Speckenmeyer. We know that all the bodies can be generated with incremental polynomial time. And only the body duals are hard. And this is MP hard, actually. This is something which we found with Leo Hachian and, and some others. Now, in general, we can view slightly differently this. We can imagine that, that uh, the points I represent as rows of a matrix in D dimension, right? Then, uh, then you can see that SA, or, or, or the complements of the duals, that is the maximal false points of that monotone Boolean function, are subsystems. SA corresponds to maximal feasible subsystems of this system of inequalities. And uh, the dual corresponds to minimal infeasible. Uh, sorry, SA co corresponds to minimal infeasible subsystems. And the dual corresponds to maximal feasible. The, the false points correspond to maximal feasible subsystems. And in general, the, the bodies similarly are minimal infeasible and maximum feasible subsystems of systems of inequalities when which are homogeneous, but you want a non-zero vector as a solution. So you are looking only non-zeros as feasible solutions. So this is a different interpretation of the previous geometric picture. And in fact, it turns out that this, is, in general, this is hard. So the previous case, we had a very, very special definition for the points. But in general, this is hard. This uh, generation problem for maximal feasible subsystems is MP-hard. And so it, this is, uh, yeah, the same, the same applies for the bodies. And uh, what I am saying, this is generating simplices is actually equivalent with vertex enumeration. So what is vertex enumeration? That you are given a, a polyhedron as a system of inequalities, and you want to generate all vertices. Now, it, this is an interesting open problem. We don't know the complexity. But we know, so this is equivalent to generating simplices in general. So you can associate to a polyhedron a set of points and map one problem to another. But we know that if, you're, if you don't require the polyhedron to be bonded, so you allow unbonded polyhedron to be inputs, then this is an MP-hard generation problem. 
In fact, for any polyhedron, any generation which would, which would first list all the vertices and then would list all the infinite directions is an NP-hard generation problem. We cannot, cannot do that easily. I think my time is slowly over. Uh, at the end, I wanted to switch back to the notion of monotonicity. We had some questions actually regarding this. How, what, how, what other families which are lattice-like families we can consider and treat similarly? And there are some old results I wanted to bring up. Imagine that we consider a quasi-order on the set of Boolean vectors. A quasi-order is an order where two, points, two vectors may be equivalent. So there are some equivalence classes, but otherwise it's transitive uh, and behaves like an order. Now, we say that the function is monotone with respect to this quasi-order if, if the truth value is growing along the order, right? So if, if a vector is uh, majorizing another one in this quasi-order, then the true value is also majorizing. So if, if it was true, it remains true. So this defines a notion of monotonicity in a different setting, right? For every quasi-order, we get that. And so we denote by C sub uh, uh, precedence this family of this precedence monotone functions, whatever that order is. And the old result of Wilhelm Nibaraki says that a class of Boolean functions, right? So there are two to the two to the n Boolean functions. It's a very large family and very rich family in structure. But you can look at some special Boolean, a subset of the Boolean functions. If this subset, this class, is closed under taking conjunction and disjunction, which is uh, the basic operations, Boolean operations, uh, monotone Boolean operations. If uh, it's closed under this, that is, this set forms a lattice with respect to these two operations, the meet and join, then this happens if and only if this class is the set of monotone functions with respect to some partial order. So being a lattice is equivalent of being monotone with respect to some order. And if you can spell out how to compute this order, if you have an oracle which behaves like the others, then everything what I said you can repeat and do the generation the same way. So I, I just give some simple examples. You may have a real matrix, M by N matrix, and you define a precedence saying binary vector X is larger than Y if the value QX is component larger than the value QY. This is, in fact, a very rich family because Q can take many, many values and the dimensions can vary. So this includes the regular monotone functions if you choose the identity matrix. This includes what we know the regular functions if you take a lower triangular 0, 1 matrix. Or it, this includes threshold functions if you take single line inequalities. So this is a very rich class. There are, and everything what we said about generation can be repeated to all these classes modulo that you have the right oracle, which in these terms can compute efficiently membership. Thank you very much. <laughs>